Well, good morning and welcome to another service at Grace Community Church, June 30th, 2018. Excuse me, did it again, didn't I? July 1st, I'm just stuck in June, aren't I? July 1st, so now you all know that I'm human, including those of you that might see this by way of internet, we say welcome. And uh, we've just been having a, I, I just think, a, a wonderful time as we've been going through the book of 1 Timothy. And, and I wanted to finish the first chapter today, and I feel like Dwight. We're just not going to get through Genesis 1 yet, right? So, But that's okay, because uh, there are things sometimes that you just need to take time with, and things that I didn't ever see before, and then it kind of comes to light, and i gotta, I got to tell the folks about it. But uh, last week we talked about the exceeding abundant grace of God. And we talked about Paul as our pattern. And, and it says, you know, that, that, that Paul was the pattern. And, and hereafter, the pattern of long-suffering. Uh, that, that Jesus Christ is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. And uh, it's a faithful and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Uh, you know, even in the Gospels, he said, I come to seek that which was lost. And, uh, and so, ultimately, not only does he uh, save us from hell, the lake of fire, uh, by his gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but he also gives us the righteousness of God. And, and so, uh, we do have that pie in the sky down the road. It's coming, folks, and it's glorious. Let me tell you, it is glorious. And we believe it because we believe the words in a book. Now, uh, this is interesting. When we get into verse 17, it says this. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And when, uh, you know how I do these word studies and these phrase studies, because I have the soft word ability to do that, I'd like to share that with you, but uh, in the Old Testament, if you just take the words, the king, and, and, and capitalize K, the king, uh, it shows up uh, 14 times in the Old Testament, and I believe 16 times in the New, uh, but let me give you a sampling of that. The king of glory, four times. The king, the Lord of hosts, seven times. The king of all the earth. The king of heaven. The Lord, the king. The king of Jacob. The king of Israel. That's the Old Testament. In the New Testament. The king of the Jews, seven times. The king of Israel, four times. The king that cometh in the name of the Lord, one time. And then in our text, the king eternal. And then in 1 Timothy 6.15, I think kind of the granddaddy of them all. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate. I just love saying that word. You know, it just means the supreme, supreme of the supreme. You know what I mean? The potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords. Does anybody else know where there's one more time where this is mentioned? The book of Revelation. The king of kings and lord of lords. So we know that prior to his incarnation, we're talking about the king of glory, the lord of hosts, the king of Jacob, the king of the Jews. When he comes on and takes in flesh, he empties himself of his glory and becomes the God-man. He then, too, is called the king. He's the king of all the earth. He's the king of heaven. I know that as grace believers, we see him as head of the body. And to Israel, he is the king of Israel. But there's a sense in which he's the king of the universe. Amen. And we know him as the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we know him today. And I said this every message. And now we know that he's been resurrected and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's ever living to make intercession for us as members of his body. I mean, how does it get any better than that? That means that God does not allow anything to come into your life or permit or cause anything to come into your life without his ultimate purpose for your life. We just, again, we need to accept that and believe that. 
So when we get into this, and I'm going to do this just a little bit uh, backwards. <laughs> yeah, that kind of fits, don't it? Uh, I, want, I want to, because there's adjectives here that describe God. The King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, and the Only Wise God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, I don't, I don't do this every Sunday, and I'm not going to do this every Sunday, but I do want to give you something to think about again. And I have to give you, again, I have to give you a little bit of history of your Bible. You see that where it says the, I'm going to do it backwards. You see where it says the only wise God? And that's just kind of fun to do. There's two verses that use that phrase, wise God, in our text. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And then of all places in Jude, which chapter in Jude? Oh, that's right. There's only one chapter in Jude, verse 25. To the only wise God, our Savior, kind of nice, add that, didn't it? Be glory and majesty, dominion and power. Forever and ever, amen. Now that's just kind of that's just kind of an interesting thing to look at. Now, what we want to do too, I want to show you something that I just I, I nobody I just was just meditating upon this and, and I want to see how I want to see what you think if that word wise is important or not. So here we go by definition. I got it highlighted for you. It means properly having knowledge. Who has knowledge? Who has all knowledge? And what do we call that, having all knowledge? No, that's all powerful. Omniscience. Omniscience, okay? Properly having knowledge, hence having the power of discerning and judging correctly or of discriminating between what is true and what is false. Having the power, because he has all knowledge. So, according to this definition, is any of his judgments or discernments, or are any of his statements, or any of the ways that he deals with man, past, present, or future, are any of them wrong? No, they can't be, can they? So when it says here that he is the only wise God, it gives him the authority to be judge over all the earth. We found that, uh, that um, when, when Abraham was dealing with, talking face to face with God, Abraham was talking to him about Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and he, he starts his deal about, you know, Lord, if there's 50 righteous in Sodom, will you, will you spare the city? Yes, I'll spare it if there's 50. And he gets all the way down to 10, doesn't he? And if there were 10 souls in the city of Sodom that were righteous, he would not destroy it. Is that not the grace of God demonstrated? And after that last thing, Abraham went his way and the Lord went his way. But I want you to see Genesis 18:25. It says, that be, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. And that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Now look at the next phrase. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? One of our definitions, or part of our definitions of wise, is being able to judge correctly. Last week we mentioned that according to Romans 2.16, that he's going to judge the secrets of men by my gospel. What did you do with that supreme and wonderful uh, offer that I had? What did you do with it? Anything? Nothing? Something? Did you believe it or not? Did you accept it? Receive it? And, that, and we're going to be judged. Not us, but unbelievers will be judged by that. And so, so shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Why can he judge right? Because he is a wise God, and we can, uh, we can interpret then that he is omniscient. He doesn't make mistakes. Now, I want to do this, and this may be all the time that I have to do. I want you to see something, and, it, and, you, and you can tell that it, it's kind of a, and, and you may not agree with this, okay? And I'm just going to say that up front, because we've been doing some things 
in regards to the scriptures. Do you remember, do you remember last week or a couple weeks ago, we talked about the 1901 American Standard Version came from 1881. Remember the revision committee, okay? And, the, and I don't have an 1881 here. I got it in here, but I don't have it here. But this is 1901, and, 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 and the, the 1881 came out with a revision committee called the Revised Version. And then 20 years later, the American scholars got a hold of it, and they changed a bit of it. Uh, actually, and they took away the word uh, capital L-O-R-D, and they put in the word Jehovah. And so in this, in this, there's very little difference except that there's 5,800 times they use where we see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. They put Jehovah in there. And then in 1952, this got revised into the Revised Standard Version. Now I'm telling you all that because I want you to see something. And, and you know, uh, words mean things. Words mean things. I want you to see this. Whoops, let's get back into our text. <clears throat> All right. Now, if you look at the left side, the Bible, I believe, to be the word and words of God. Okay? I just believe that. It says, now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible. You see the word? You see that there? The only wise God. Now, I want you to go over one step. That's, this is 1881. Okay? This is the revised version. A group of people got together, and, 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 uh, and Mr. Westcott and Mr. Hort gave them a copy of their critical text, and they infuse that into their translation. That's what happened. Now, look at this. Now, unto the king eternal, incorruptible, invisible, the only... What are we missing? Let me ask you something. If you take the word wise out of that verse, does that strengthen or weaken the doctrine of omniscience? <clears throat> Does it strengthen it or weaken it? It weakens it, doesn't it? Now, it's still there. Okay, I mean, the idea of only God, okay, the only one, but it weakens it. 1901, what did we do? It's, it's still gone. Why is that? Because this is just a reflection of this, with the exception primarily of the word Lord changing to Jehovah. Now, now this is in 1952. This came out in 19... This is a revision of this, okay? 1952. Then they went ahead and went back to Lord. They, this was Jehovah, 5,800 times. They went back to Lord, similar to this. But what also is still missing? Wise. And the reason for that, I have the uh, West Cotton Hort Greek text on here, and I could show you, but I'm not going to. But the, the word wise isn't in there. It weakens the doctrine of God being a righteous judge. And having all knowing and all power and being omniscient. That's what it does. So I just I think that's very interesting. Now, we're gonna look at one thing here while we're at it, and then we're gonna get off of this. If you also notice, it says now unto the king eternal. How many of you are eternal? You guys are pretty smart. How many of you guys are immortal or have or will become immortal? That's, that's right, Melissa. Yes, okay? It's interesting. We're going to look at definitions in a minute. But in, eternal has the idea behind it. There's, a, there's two or three definitions we're going to look at. And, and the first definition is having no beginning and no ending. And you are right. You, that doesn't fit you in that first definition, does it? You had a beginning, but you're not going to have an ending. Okay? That's interesting, isn't it? So these, this gentleman, these gentlemen here, we still got it, don't we? Now under the king eternal, right? So, so what they're saying is God, the king, the Lord of hosts, the God of Jacob, the God of Israel, the God of heaven, the God of earth, he is eternal. He always has been and always will be. So it strengthens or it leaves intact the doctrine of the eternal existence of God. He always has been, he had no beginning, and he has no end. So everybody else does pretty well, except in 1952. We didn't like that. So we had to revise that a little bit. And now it says, to the king of ages. Now, is that, is that the same thing as saying that God is eternal? Or the king is eternal? Well, you could say he's, a, you know, the, all the ages combined. And yeah, he's a, does it weaken or strengthen 
the doctrine of the eternality of God. It weakens it, doesn't it? And now it's still there. You could make the argument for that. But I wanted to show that to you. I think that's interesting stuff. And I think my opinion, this is not necessarily all of your opinions. I'm not speaking for the church per se. I am a filler of the pulpit. I'm not the pastor here, so to speak. But my conviction is there's some, there's some corruption that has gone on. And you can see it over and over and over again. I was trying to find in rat poison uh, the ingredients in rat poison. Did you know that uh, a derivative of, of Coumadin is what you in know, rat poison? I didn't know that. But did you know that it is a very, very small amount before you have corruption? And what happens to that poor little rat is when you, do, when you give him that uh, Coumadin, his blood thins, breaks the capillaries of the blood vessels, and he dies. That's why the doctor, if you're taking Coumadin or Warfarin, the generic, that's why you have to go in for a protein every three weeks because they don't want your blood to get too thin because you cut yourself, you bleed to death. And you all, you all probably know that. So anyway, I just, uh, just found that to be just absolutely uh, fascinating. So now let's go back in here, and let's take a look at the word eternal. <clears throat> and there we are. Does that fit you or God? That only fits God, doesn't it? Does that fit you or God? That's only God, isn't it? Now, if you'll notice here, now, now, now notice this. Without end of existing or duration, everlasting, endless, or immortal. Does that fit you and God? Yes, it does. And, and it's immortal. Isn't, and I saw that word immortal, which, which God is too. But it not only does it mean no end of existence, if we look at the word immortal, which God is, we find out that it says it has no principle of alteration or corruption. Okay? So, in Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching. And he says, as David says, I will not suffer my Holy One to see corruption. See? He, he was, his body was not going to rot. In, in, in the tomb. He was there three days and three nights. His body was, he went into hell. We know that. The Bible says that. Now, now, you were given what kind of life when you trusted Christ? Eternal. eternal life. So we can put the word eternal in front of life because we're not talking about the first part of eternal, no beginning, no end, or we're not talking about that. Now, where it says about uh, immortal, uh, no, no principle of alteration or uh, corruption, exempt from death, having life or being that shall never end as an immortal soul. Now, your soul, everybody's soul is immortal. But your body is not immortal yet, is it? When does your body become immortal in that, and in that sense, eternal? When does that happen? Yeah, and the passage of Scripture is 1 Corinthians 15, isn't it? For this mortality, he's talking about the changing of the body. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And then our bodies, the dead in Christ, shall rise first. Then we which are alive shall remain and be caught up to, uh, and, 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 our, and we shall be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. The whole passage here, 1 Corinthians 15, 53 to 58, you all know it by heart. But that's when your body is going to enjoy immortality and, in that sense, eternal. You could say you're eternal at that point. Now, you're eternal, your soul is anyway. The ironic thing or the interesting thing is, is that the unbeliever is also given uh, an uh, eternal existence. It, it's just, you know, where, where does the unbeliever spend that eternal existence? And if we listen to the preacher in Arkansas, there is no such thing. When you're dead, you're dead. It's done. But if we will read Revelation 14 or Revelation 20 or Matthew or Mark to chapter 9 or Matthew 25 or, or, or uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, when God comes back in vengeance, fire taking uh, vengeance on those that obey, uh, know not God nor obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall suffer eternal torment, eternal punishment, so the soul is immortal. Others would teach you that the soul dies. We call that soul sleep. So this, this king that you and I 
worship, and he is now the head of the body in this age. He is eternal. He is immortal. And he is invisible. He is not perceptive to the naked eye. The state of being invisible, imperceptibleness to the sight. You simply cannot see him. God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But we can't see him. So as we gather this morning, we're looking at his words in a book that he's put together and preserved. We have no visual manifestation. None of you have seen God. <clears throat> and, and the Bible has declared and, and, and said this, you've heard this 100,000 times, that without faith, it is impossible to please him. You must believe that he is. So faith, faith is believing without seeing, unlike Thomas, who saw, and when he recognized the Lord, the risen Lord's body, and the scar prints, nail prints, he, he, he falls to his knees, my Lord and my God. And there's a blessing there for, blessed are you, Thomas, for you believe without seeing. Blessed are those that believe and have not seen. You see that? So that's really a, a, a it's just really a wonderful truth that he is invisible, we haven't seen him. And that's why, that's why last week when we talked about the wonderful moment when you're going to, when your faith is going to turn into sight. And that's going to happen to every single believer, either at the rapture or at death. And the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul had a, he had a problem in his life. He had a dilemma. In Philippians, he had a dilemma. You know, should I stay here? It's more needful if I stay here and help you, but, but to depart and be with Christ is far better. So we mourn, we mourn the loss of loved ones. We, we mourn the loss of Don. We mourn the loss of my mom and dad. Your mom, your parents, your siblings. We mourn that loss, but for the believer, I'm sad for you, Luella. I'm happy for Don. Would it have been nice to stay here longer? Yeah. But I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy that he's in heaven. What a glorious truth that is, and what a wonderful thing we have. The king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Father, we just thank you again for this time together, brief it as, it, as it has been, and we're just so glad that we know you by faith, that we talk to you by faith, we've never seen you, we've never seen your son, and yet, Father, we believe because of the words in the book, and we thank you for that. Pray now you bless our communion service as well, in Christ's name, amen. <laughs>